Hi, I'm James McGuire, and on today's eSpeaks, we're talking about the state of online fraud in the small and mid-sized enterprise market. We'll take a look at some of the strategies that are helping win against fraud. To explore that, I'm joined by Art O'Kane, Vice President of Cybersecurity and Incident Response at Arium. Art, good to have you with us today. <laughs> Thanks, James. So let's talk about online fraud. It's a definite business. There's so many headlines and so many businesses under attack. Uh, what's the state of online fraud attacks today, specifically in the SME market? What's going on there? So it's increasing at the SMB and SME uh, markets right now. Uh, attackers have found that when they are trying to attack large enterprise, it's bringing negative pressure on them from the federal investigators. Uh, and, and Colonial Pipeline really created that problem. Uh, so when that ransomware attack happened, uh, the FBI engaged immediately and DarkSide ended up having to go underground. Mm. And that was an example really for all of the other attackers, all the other threat actors. Uh, and most of the ransom was actually clawed back by the FBI, the ransom that was paid. Mm. So that really taught them a lesson that, okay, we shouldn't aim for the big fish anymore. We should aim for the SMB and SME. And that actually poses a huge problem because the SMB and the SME have no security controls in place. Right. A lot of them are just struggling to run a business. And, you know, in, in small and medium enterprise, a lot of them have gotten to a size where they have a decent amount of data that's valuable to an attacker. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's really opportunities for an attacker to sell that data and make a, a good amount of money in addition to the ransom and the extortion. And there's limited controls in place. A lot of times those SMEs only have one IT guy or mm -hmm. a very small IT team, and they're really unprepared for a full attack. Mm -hmm. And not to blame them, a lot of times those IT people at those companies have an extremely advanced skill set, mm -hmm. and they're able to do a lot of things. It's just that they're overwhelmed. It's mm -hmm. one person or two people trying to handle everything. So the SME is really sort of like low hanging fruit. Uh, is there a specific sector within SME that is particularly endangered? So right now, and this is kind of surfaced by the FTC safeguards, uh, the auto industry, uh, auto dealers specifically are, are really uh, have been targeted a lot. In fact, uh, according to the CDK Global, 85% of IT people at auto dealerships have said that they've been breached. Wow. So 85% of car dealerships. And if you think about what a car dealership is, it's, it's fundamentally a sales organization. Cybersecurity is usually not a super high priority to them. And acquiring the kind of skill set and the technology needed to really protect themselves is a significant investment. And that a lot of times goes by the wayside. Hmm. So are the, the car dealerships are an example of a target that is a pretty affluent target, but maybe underprotected. Yes. Um, so what's an example of a company that is effectively fighting fraud? So banks, hmm. if you look at even small credit unions and small banks, they have a lot of controls in place. Mm -hmm. They're not regulated by the FTC. They're, they have different compliance organizations that they have to answer to. And they've been having to fight fraud for a long time very well. So, you know, when you try to do a transfer with a bank, they will call and verify and make sure that that it's not, you know, a fraud attempt. Those kind of controls just and those processes are very mature at banks and they're new to, to someplace like a car dealership. Mm -hmm. And the FTC, those same safeguard rules apply to car dealerships, mortgage brokers, real estate brokers, anyone who's handling consumer data in a financial transaction where it would be like a credit application. And so it really applies to everybody, but car dealerships seem to be the prime target because of that low hanging fruit right there. And, but yeah, the banks are the example to look to as far as who can do it well. I'm going to guess the the banks are in a completely different category in terms of protecting themselves against cyber fraud than the car dealerships. Yes. 
Yeah, they even a small bank, even a community bank that only has one location, mm -hmm. it has so much layered security in place to deal with this. So and and security processes, and they've had to have these information security programs in place, and incident response programs, and disaster recovery plans, and things like that. There, even the smallest bank has had to deal with so much cybersecurity and so much fraud training and and hardening against that yeah yeah i think i, I once heard a bank of america executive speak and he said that they they ward off or try to ward off four thousand cyber attacks a week and this was years ago mm -hmm. uh so obviously they're they're a big big target um let, let's talk about Ar arium specifically what sets arium apart in the security sector I mean, why would a company choose arium arium is really an enterprise grade security company that's really focusing at the SME. So we have a huge skill set and a lot of IT operations expertise and frontline ransomware fighting experience. We have a large incident response team that fights ransomware constantly. So we have a lot of experience in this space that a lot of companies don't have. Uh, you know, a lot of companies are trying to get into cybersecurity because it's a good opportunity to make money but they really haven't seen the attacks like we have. So, you know, we have 20 years of IT operations expertise. Each, each part of our company is very experienced. So uh, that really gives us a competitive advantage in offering a great solution. So if I'm hearing you correctly, it's almost you, you're trying to offer the, the upper level protection, the, the large enterprise protection to the, um, to the SMEs. Yes, yeah. A lot of our products are really enterprise products that we've bundled in and priced in a way that the SMEs can can afford them. Uh, a lot of those have a really high barrier to entry in order to purchase them. Uh, just the amount of licenses you have to buy, a minimum purchase quantity, that kind of thing. Uh, so we're handling that in order to give a better product to our clients. And you know whether it's IT operations, cybersecurity, and digital transformation, we're picking up that that solution and trying to bundle it and give the best solution to our clients. What's an example of a, of a tool or two that you would definitely recommend? Like you must have this in place. Well, MFA uh, always, but and and there's so many great solutions. Duo, Okta, uh, even if you're using 365 and you're just using. Uh, multi-factor authentication through Azure Active Directory. Mm -hmm. uh, there are so many great ways to do MFA, but without that, companies are really naked nowadays. So mm -hmm. that's that's just a bare minimum hygiene. Uh, and then good cloud backups of all critical systems. Mm -hmm. And this is something that's really honestly rare. A lot of a lot of companies just think that that a backup, a local backup, is good enough. And they may think that taking a drive offsite once a month or something like that is, is an acceptable version of an offsite backup. Mm -hmm. uh, but when there's a disaster or there's ransomware or some kind of breach where we need to recover quickly, uh, we find that most of them don't have a recovery path. Mm -hmm. And cloud backup solutions aren't that prohibitively expensive. Mm -hmm. So it's just something that people just neglect and need to start layering in. You know, interesting that you mentioned ransomware. I think businesses live in fear of that these days. Mm -hmm. Is is that cloud backup part of the solution? There be, is, is there an answer to ransomware? What can companies mm -hmm. do? Yeah, so I think that there's always going to be a way that an attacker can get in. And it, it, there's always going to be an, a way that an attacker will be able to uh, leverage malware such as ransomware in order to compromise data. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we're escaping that. But the answer to ransomware is in order to not pay a ransom and to get back quickly is, is going to be a good cloud backup solution. Uh, but in order to prevent it from happening in the first place, it's really multi-factor authentication and then having good endpoint and network detection response. And that's the tricky part for a lot of small businesses and, and, and small enterprises and medium sized enterprises is they can't afford a SOC. Uh, they don't. They may buy some antivirus or something like that, but there's nobody monitoring their machines and network. Mm -hmm. So even if, even if every piece of security tooling was screaming loudly that there was something happening, mm -hmm. there's nobody watching it. Mm 
-hmm. So because it's unmanaged, you know, the, the attacker can live and dwell on the network for a long time. Well, which brings us to zero trust. I mean, that zero mm -hmm. trust, the proponents say zero trust can help protect against that. I mean, what's your take Absolutely. on zero trust? Absolutely. So that is, is network segmentation is really what I was, what I consider, uh, you know, zero trust to be a part of or a relabeling of that. Mm -hmm. But uh, keeping the blast radius minimized is is important you want to set up segmentation and zero trust so that if someone in hr uh, activates ransomware or any other malware whether it's credential theft malware or anything it's limited to their group to or their computer uh it it's not able to spread to the finance department it's not able to spread to engineering and production mm -hmm. things like that and that's really what zero trust is trying to accomplish and that's an extremely important control uh, when I was at Net Diligence this year in Philly, uh, speaking to cyber insurance companies and other incident response firms, uh, network segmentation and zero trust is in the top five controls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does seem like it's very hot these days. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I'd love to get your sense of what's coming in the future. Say we're, we're two, three years out. I mean, what do you see in terms of future attacks? You know, where are they going to be coming from and how can we protect ourselves now? Future attacks are going to be kind of a variant of ransomware. Uh, right now, we're seeing extortion without the encryption starting right. to happen more. So the breach will happen. They'll steal your data. And then, you know, and this really will only affect really important data or, or data that is, you know, either IP or, or data that's extremely, you know, high risk PII. But without corrupting the data, taking it and off, and saying that they're gonna sell it or breach it if they're mm -hmm. not paid. So it's, it's the extortion portion of the ransomware engagement without the actual encryption. And so that's on the rise right now. And that may be because of Colonial Pipeline, because of taking down something big had negative effects. Mm -hmm. We've also seen that hospitals, when they've had ransomware, it's had devastating effects to hospitals. Some of them have been down for a long time and it's affected patients' ability to get medications, things like that. So because of that, um, I believe that attackers are gonna use more of an extortion approach without the actual uh, corruption. But there's always a chance they could come up with some new variant of attack completely that is just mm -hmm. not even related to that, but uh, they're making a lot of money with ransomware and you know extortion is just another way to to say give me your money in exchange for your data yeah i mean is there a particular protection you recommend against extortion like that so that's the tricky part is you can't really it where ransomware you would restore from a backup or a cloud backup right with extortion it's you don't need to restore you still have your data but so they have it right yeah the only thing you can really do is prevent at that point, and and that's really difficult. That really means that your company has to be on everything as far as security. It needs to have network detection response, endpoint detection response, MFA, zero trust. It has to have all the controls in place in order to uh, deflect the attack in the first place. Mm -hmm. What about the idea of, of automation and or AI? I mean, I've, I've heard mixed reports on that in terms of cybersecurity. Some say, oh, it's really just an activity. So I'll just say, oh, it's absolutely necessary. I mean, where, where do you come down on that? So I think it's extremely exciting right now mm -hmm. because there are companies like Deep Instinct that are using AI platforms for their endpoint protection. And they're very sharp. They're very sharp as far as the ability to detect uh, really behavior. So I think that that's going to be a part of every day very soon. I, I think that it's going to be a necessity to use AI. Uh, right now, for instance, the, the obstacle of building a SOC, uh, that's highly a human expense. You know, you're, you're paying a lot of high wages for people in order to monitor and watch things. If that can be automated and if that can be supplemented with using AI and machine learning, then a SOC of 20 people could become a SOC of one mm -hmm. and just validate what the machine is telling you, that kind of thing. You know, I, that, I have, that could be huge. Yeah, right. True. Right. I've I've also heard that as well in terms of the the employee headcount going down. But somehow I think that 
with the complexity of the text, even with AI, the, the headcount may not go down after mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that we will see all companies, all cyber companies growing in the future here because uh, especially with things like the FCC safeguards that are coming out, uh, it's imposing more requirements on companies that have never had to take on that tech. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's going to be more demand for people to, to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think the headcount is still going to be there. It's just that now the volume is going to be so much higher. Uh, so and that volume is going to have to be supplemented with AI. All right, I think you said it. It's a lot of interesting stuff. It's going to be fascinating to watch the sector change in the years ahead. Uh, thanks so much for sharing your insight today. Thank you.